Great. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to welcome students and faculty to a Villanova Finance Group Speaker Series event. Tonight promises to be a very special evening with a truly remarkable and inspirational man. Before we, like, before we proceed, I'd just like to introduce our panelists from Villanova tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Joyce Russell, Dean of the um, Villanova School of Business, Rohan Parekh, a Senior Applied Quantitative Finance major and co-president of VFG, Liz Ford, a Senior Finance major and president of Villanova's Women in Finance Society, and Madhav Pandaya, a sophomore future finance major who is actually responsible for helping set up tonight's call. Um, he read, his, he read Mr. Schwartzman's book and he called his office and said he'd like to ask him some questions. So um, truly remarkable. Um, I would also like to introduce, um, who'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. It's my pleasure to welcome our university provost, Dr. Patrick Majidi. As Villanova's chief academic officer, Dr. Majidi is responsible for setting and prioritizing the university's overall academic mission. He is the second ranking officer of the university and leads in the absence of the president. Dr. Majidi previously served as a Dean of the Villanova School of Business and holds the rank of Professor of Strategic Management and Entrepreneurship. Prior to academia, Dr. Majidi spent 15 years in the steel and mining industries where he founded two successful companies and held a variety of roles, including CEO. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Majidi. Thank you, Professor Padovano. It's a pleasure to be here. Very much uh, excited for tonight's event. Thank you to all the students that you mentioned for uh, their being entrepreneurial in their efforts to get this set up and connecting with Mr. Schwartzman. We're very lucky to, uh, to have him here tonight. And I'm excited uh, to be the one that gets to introduce him to, to everyone. <clears throat> Mr. Schwartzman is chairman, CEO, and co-founder of Blackstone, a leading global investment firm with $564 billion in assets under management and businesses in private equity, real estate, hedge funds, credit, infrastructure, and life sciences. Together with his friend and co-founder Pete Peterson, Mr. Schwartzman built Blackstone into the leading global financial institution that it is, focusing intensely on culture, hiring great talent, and establishing processes that allow the firm to systematically analyze and evaluate risk. Both he and the firm are known for the rigor of their investment process, their innovative approach to deal making, the diversification of their business lines, and a conviction to be the best at everything they do. Mr. Schwartzman, a graduate of Yale University and Harvard Business School, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Business Roundtable, and International Business Council of the World Economic Fund. He was named one of Barron's most, their world's best CEOs in 2019, one of Forbes' top 50 world's most powerful people in 2018, Forbes' most influential person in finance in 2016, and one of Time's 100 most influential people in 2007. My favorite, though, is uh, when I was with alum, an alum recently, a very successful private equity guy. He said that Mr. Schwartzman is the goat of private equity, the greatest of all time. So that's a uh, high praise indeed. In both business and philanthropy, Mr. Schwartzman dedicates himself to tackling big problems with transformative solutions, an approach that certainly resonates with our Augustinian community. As an active philanthropist, he uses the skills learned over a lifetime in finance to design, establish, and support impactful and innovative organizations and initiatives. He has a history of supporting education, culture, and the arts, among other things, and has donated more than a billion dollars to help things such as the Center at the University of Oxford to redefine the study of the humanities for the 21st century. He established that, created a new college at MIT dedicated to the study of artificial intelligence, built a first of its kind student center at Yale, renovated and expanded the New York Public Library, and found an international, founded an international fellowship program, the Schwartzman Scholars at Tsinghua University in Beijing to educate future leaders about China. Mr. Schwartzman's New York Times bestselling book, What It Takes, Lessons in the Pursuit of Excellence, shares impactful episodes from his life to show how readers how to build, transform, and lead thriving organizations. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Schwartzman to Villanova. Welcome.
Thank you, Provost Majidian, and thank you, Mr. Schwartzman, for joining us. Speaking of Villanova today, we are excited to hear your stories, advice, um, and a lot of us really enjoyed reading your book over the past few weeks. Our, our first question comes from Dr. Joyce Russell, the Dean of the Villanova School of Business. So I just wanted to say I loved your book um, and um, love uh, leadership books, and I thought you just gave incredible examples and um, great tips. In, in your book, you talk about your time at Lehman Brothers and some of the mistakes and um, issues in terms of their management team and the lessons you learned from that. And I'm just wondering, how did you take that? Because sometimes people learn um, how to be successful from the mistakes that they've seen. How did you use that to create such a great culture um, at Blackstone? Well, that's, that's a great question. Uh, be, before I give you the answer to that, uh, I just want to thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm from Philadelphia, uh, and I was raised in two parts of it. The, the first was Northeast Philadelphia. I would have gone to Northeast High School probably if I didn't go to Central. Uh, uh, and then we moved to the suburbs uh, uh, when, when I was in uh, ninth grade uh, to Abington, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, and and um, we had this amazing track team. Uh, and we won the state championship. Uh, and the people at Villanova uh, were nice enough to let us periodically come across town and train uh, on your track uh, with these, these heroes, uh, these idols of ours, because Villanova uh, in 1963, four and five, uh, had one of the best teams in the country. Uh, in track, the coach I think it was Jumbo Elliott, uh, and and you know, amazing sprinters, uh, uh, Olympic champions, as well as distance runners, especially uh, in the mile, and to be in the tenth or eleventh grade and be on the track side by side uh, with these icons in America uh, was was such a overwhelming type of thing uh, that uh, I, I developed enormous appreciation uh, for the spirit uh, at Villanova. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the reasons I accepted this today, uh, because it's a lesson for everybody that if you're nice to people who have talent, you know, they, they pay it back in a way. Uh, they're loyal, they're appreciative. Uh, so it's a good thing to, to do and be nice to other people. So that wasn't the question, but that was a random answer, uh, not to the question. But, it was a good one now too. <laughs> right, for a start. But, but basically, you know, what, what I learned is that you can have extremely talented people uh, like we did at Lehman, uh, you know, pound for pound, and people weren't overweight back then. Uh, we still uh, were really amazing as a firm. However, uh, if you have uh, a, a defective culture, uh, if you have poisonous uh, internal uh, politics, a lack of cooperation, uh, everybody for themselves uh, kind of attitude, uh, th then you can be outperformed uh, by other organizations that don't have so many gifted people working together as a team. Uh, and I watched uh, uh, people who were older than myself uh, uh, make critically wrong decisions out of their own personal self-interest. And I vowed, uh, I sold the firm actually when it was in financial trouble uh, to the American Express Company. And I vowed that if I ever did something on my own uh, I, I would do the opposite uh, of, of what happened uh, at Lehman, that, that we'd have a completely different culture with people who cooperate with openness, uh, with, with integrity, um, uh, without uh, a, a culture where for you to get promoted, you sort of have to take somebody else out. Uh, what a horrible, you know, dynamic uh, that, that creates. So I, I wanted to have a completely different kind of model, uh, which, which we have done. Uh, and, and sometimes you, you have to suffer 
um, by watching something that you love, that you pour your heart into, be destroyed uh, by, by some of the grown-ups uh, fighting among themselves. In finance, it, it happens with too much frequency. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we set up an organization uh, to do the opposite in many ways. Uh, and and that, that's turned out to be a great decision. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Steve, thank you so much for telling us a little bit about the culture of Blackstone. Now, stepping back to your own experiences, throughout your book, you emphasize the harder the problem, the more limited the competition. From your own experience, specifically within creative, creating Blackstone, what do you believe is the hardest problem that you've overcome? Gee whiz, there's so many problems. Entrepreneurship may be a little, you know, sort of over uh, uh, lionized. Um, when you start, you, you have an endless series of problems. Uh, in our case, um, uh, we, we just thought we'd be successful, um, <laughs> like most entrepreneurs. Why? because we'd always been successful uh, in life and we were going into a, a very similar business. Uh, we started uh, with mergers and acquisitions uh, and uh, our strategic plan for called for us to go into private equity and then into other areas of enormous uh, sort of uh, you know, potential investment potential that would happen during different cycles, different asset classes would get better and we wanted to go into those uh, with great people, uh, tens, uh, with um, a, a, an area that was so undervalued that even we could make it successful. And the third criteria uh, was that um, uh, we would generate uh, intellectual capital in that area, which would be useful for the other things that we did. That was our strategic plan. So as you say, what went wrong or what was hard answer virtually everything. Uh, the first thing we overlooked was the fact that there were no M&A boutiques in the United States. This was perhaps a fall short uh, because we set ourselves up as an M&A boutique and we sent out about 500 letters announcing the firm and we thought we would be flooded with business. Why? Uh, because at, at Lehman, we had the most active M&A department. Goldman Sachs did more aggregate volume. Uh, you know, I was running that at the end. Uh, my partner uh, had been the chairman of Lehman. We we're always busy. How could we not be busy just because we changed office locations? Well, the answer is nobody wanted to hire us. This was shocking. You ever send out 500 letters? And it's like, the mail didn't get delivered, not a phone call, not a note. Uh, you want to know what problems are? That's a problem. So, so what we did is we called everyone and um, those that would take the call. And the best we got is, well, we don't have anything going on now, but we might consider you. And eventually somebody did and they paid us uh, $50,000 for a small assignment. I, I must tell you that I never had a legal bill less than $50,000 when I was at Lehman Brothers. And this was our revenue, you know, for like the first six months. Uh, there's nothing more frightening than starting undercapitalized. We, we had $400,000 uh, and, and watching that go down to try and approach zero. Uh, so, so we got, you know, the fact that everybody would hire us because we were the same two people, but we didn't have a name. We, we, didn't, we didn't do what the market was expecting. So we, we pioneered a whole asset class and pioneering a whole asset class is harder than you think. The next thing that we got wrong um, was when we went into the private equity business. Uh, I said uh, an objective of a billion dollars, which would have made us the third biggest group in the world. Uh, you know, I forgot to uh, take into account that neither my partner nor myself had ever made a private equity investment. 
I, I didn't think that was a big deal. I had worked with the few firms that were doing that. It didn't look too hard to me. Uh, but, but we sent out about 400 uh, offering circulars and once again, nobody responded. And as it worked out at the end of the day, to shorten this story, only one out of every 17 investors as potentials uh, invested with us, which means we were turned down by 16 out of 17 people. I, I must tell you, that is pretty depressing. You know, you wake up in the morning and you know somebody's gonna throw, you know, sort of bucket of cold water to, at you uh, and maybe more than once a day. Uh, so, so when you say, what did we, in effect, experience that was unintended, what was tough? Uh, you know, there are great stories of, by the book, you'll see it, um, of, of how we made it through. Well, one thing I'd say uh, is when you have what you think is a really good idea, whether it was our advisory business that became successful, of course, um, in, in the private equity business, uh, you just never give up. You, you just keep going, no matter what the level of setback, what the abuse, the insults, uh, people who schedule meetings with you and then don't show up after you travel to another city. That was one of my favorites. I had that a few times. You have almost no money. You paid it for an airplane. You go there, you get a cab. You get to the place and they say they don't know who you are and you just confirmed the day before. You know, it's not like you have a fantasy life that isn't being realized. I mean, how could people do that? People do that. And, and, and so my memories uh, from that period, as you can tell, are quite sharp. Uh, and um, it, it's not always easy uh, as an entrepreneur. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. And sort of as a follow up, I know you talked a little bit about the hardships you faced when you were starting Blackstone, but what is the hardest problem that you're dealing with now? If you had to say. Jeez. Uh, now, there are different kinds of problems. Uh, some are around COVID. Uh, how do you get people to go back to work uh, when there's basically no COVID in New York City? That, that's a fascinating issue, uh, dealing with people's fears, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, sort of a government that is not inspiring any confidence uh, in its citizens in New York, local government. Just, you know, you can see all this crime and other types of uh, problems. And, and you say, how can I overcome a government that doesn't work right? Uh, you know, to, to bring our people uh, together. Um, I, I think um, you know, some of it is, is just, you know, the, the sheer nature uh, of, of the fact that, you know, COVID isn't going away until we make it go away uh, with the vaccine, uh, with more um, uh, antivirals, all of which are coming. Uh, but in the interim, you have people's emotional lives. Uh, to deal with. Uh, you have a society that more or less has lost its balance, lost its way. You know, violence, uh, anger, uh, lack of, of sort of, um, you know, expected behavior, courtesy, things like that. And that, that affects all kinds of different things. Um, you know, it's not as simple as, as just running a business as if it's a machine. It involves humans uh, and it, it, it involves values. Uh, and when you start questioning whether, you know, meritocracy makes any sense, uh, you know, as a concept, um, what are you all doing there, right? You're, you're trying to get trained so you can do well. Uh, if, if a chunk of society says, I don't want you to do well, that's unfair. Um, I, I don't think it's unfair. But what we're dealing with now are some concept of core beliefs. 
in the society or being debated. Uh, and so when you ask me what the biggest issues are, it's not finding good investments because it's a little harder because prices are higher, but we, we always find a way to do interesting, uh, clever things. And there's always some place in the world where we can do that. Uh, and we can still recruit. We, we typically um, get about 21,000 people looking for 88 positions. My math skills are not good enough to know what that percent is, but it's, it's you know, I think it's like three tenths of 1%. So pick your best school in the world in terms of tough to get into. and It's a lot harder to get hired uh, at Blackstone. But those types of normal business issues uh, raising money, we still raise a lot of money, um, are, are things you can cope with, you can adjust, you can focus. Um, you know, the biggest issue business-wise is the world's moved into two classes, disruptors and disrupted. And any asset you own, some of it used to be sort of safe for five or 10 years something like coca-cola forever uh all of a sudden nothing is predictable nothing is safe everything can be uh challenged uh you know as a result of technology and other other reasons and, and so in that sense you have to make sure you're on the right side uh, of where the world's going for sure uh and no organization is always completely geared to what's exactly happening and where the easy success is. And, and so you, you, you constantly are fighting some type of rear guard action to take where you're vulnerable and up update that. But I don't, you know, I worry about those types of things, but that's like just normal stuff. Uh, the, the, the kinds of issues I talked about at the beginning are, are much more trouble uh, and much more impactful uh, than a few points of return uh, you know, either way. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve, for answering that question. Um, Rohan has the next question. So pivoting a bit, um, in today's environment, what industries are you looking at as exciting investment opportunities that provide a lot of value? We, we're spending a lot of time uh, on life science things. Uh, we, we, we decided several years ago uh, to, to pioneer major initiative uh, in that area. We looked around, and this will just tell you the funniness of life. Uh, we looked at a lot of different parts of uh, life sciences, and we settled on a relatively small company that did something called stage three trials of new drugs. Now, who heard about stuff like that other than people who specialized in medicine? Now on CNBC, you know, every morning starting at six, you hear about stage three trials, you know, for the Oxford vaccine, for Moderna, for Pfizer, for J&J. &J. And so we went into that business right at the right time. Uh, and, and we're going to build a, you know, a very substantial uh, business taking advantage of those trends. We, we also uh, have found uh, growth equity uh, to be extremely interesting as well, which takes advantage of technology as well as another uh, group of, of, of trends that drive uh, rapid growth. And, and, and so those areas uh, and technology generally, which you can play in different ways from buying things as seemingly pedestrian uh, as warehouses uh, because warehouses are needed to distribute um, uh, the, the supply chain uh, of goods from companies that, that are selling virtual goods like Amazon and almost every retailer now needs a major presence uh, and we, we, we've bought one billion uh, square feet. I don't know whether you know how big one billion is of square feet. I'm not sure I do, but it's a lot. Uh, and, and, you know, we're the largest uh, owner now of, uh, of warehouses uh, in most parts of the world. And, and so there are a lot of interesting areas 
uh, to be involved with. And so um, I can go on for quite a while, but then I'll burn up our time. So you can go on and ask another question. Thank you. Our, our next question comes from Madhav Pandya, who's a freshman, a sophomore in the Vilna School of Business. All right, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Mrs. Schwartzman, for uh, replying to my email and uh, uh, getting on this uh, video call with us today. Uh, my question to you is, um, is mostly about, like, throughout your professional career, you have had uh, numerous mentors. Uh, what is the most impactful piece of advice that you have received from a mentor on your career journey? Well, that's pretty easy for me to answer. Uh, I was going to drop out of Harvard Business School in December uh, of my first year. Uh, I found it pretty boring. Uh, all they were teaching, uh, I, I thought, uh, in every different um, uh, so, sort of uh, area was that everything relates to everything. In other words, if you're making a product, uh, and it's, you design a good product, but you can't produce it, then bad things happen to you. Uh, if you design a good product, uh, manufacture it, but you have no sales capability that's any good, bad things happen to you. If you don't handle your human resources right, you have nobody to build things, that is a bad thing. So by the time you finish all that, you realize everything has got to work and everything's got to be brought along pretty much in order. Uh, and, you know, once I got that concept, I, I didn't need to hear it uh, in every class underlying the, the specific case. And so I was going to drop out, and I wrote a note to uh, the um, president of the firm where I worked before I uh, went to business school. Uh, the name of the firm doesn't exist now was Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jeff Rett. And the person I wrote the letter to, uh, uh, there were letters then, not emails, uh, was Dick Jennerette. Uh, and I asked him if he had a place for me back at the firm. And he wrote me a note and he said, Steve, uh, I was gonna drop out in December of my first year also, but I was gonna transfer uh, to um, uh, the economics department and get a PhD. He said, I thought that would be more intellectually fulfilling. He said, I didn't. And that was the best decision I made because look where I am now. And he said, you shouldn't drop out either. You should suck it up and, and complete what you're doing and you'll be way better off. Now he did that in six pages. He was a very eloquent writer, but nobody ever wrote me a note that was that long. And he was the head of a, of a securities firm. So, so I, was, I was really overwhelmed that he took so much interest uh, in me. And so I stayed. And had I not stayed, uh, I'm not sure I would have been doing. But one thing I'm pretty sure, I wouldn't be on this Zoom with 500 people from Villanova. That's one thing I wouldn't have been doing. And, and so that was the most impactful advice uh, I ever received. Uh, I just have a follow-up question regarding that. You also mentioned uh, you took advice from Dick Jenderit. You also reached out to Avril Harman early on in the career. So like, uh, my question to you is, like, um, how can today's generation better network and identify mentors? Well, geez, it's a lot easier for you. You can reach almost anybody. Uh, this email is amazing. Oh, look at these Zooms, okay? You, you, you're meeting me, you wouldn't have met me. I wouldn't have had the time to drive down uh, to Philadelphia to do this. So the world is in effect easier on a certain level uh, because we're all meeting people. I am too, uh, meeting people I didn't know, but I wanted to know. And, and now they, they just pop up. On Zoom, I even met Mr. Zoom. Uh, you know, I talked to him for like an hour and a half uh, a month ago. Uh, you know, he's Chinese and I do a lot of stuff in China. And, you know, he, he, he tried to come to the States uh, to, to get a job. He was turned down seven times um, for visas. 
uh, and he got it the eighth time. He worked at two organizations briefly, and then he started this little company that, that did Zoom, and it was little. And today he's one of the richest guys in the world. And, you know, I, somebody arranged a phone call with me and, and, you know, because I do a lot of stuff in China, he, you know, we had a lot to talk about and it was fascinating. Here's a guy right at the center, uh, the, you know, the center of this crazy COVID world, you know, money's rolling in so fast. I think he's worth like $15 billion now. Uh, lovely guy. And, you know, I was, you know, we were just sort of BSing and was giving him advice on things. So I'll end up, you know, being helpful to him. Uh, the, the same with the guy who's running ByteDance now. You may have heard of this company, they own TikTok. Uh, so this is in the news every day. So what was I doing dealing with him? So, so all I can say is that there are some upsides in the COVID world. Uh, and your ability to reach out, geez, you, you got me involved. How did you do that? Uh, you know, so, so don't, don't have a negative view uh, on, on how you, you get people engaged with your life. You reach out to them. Um, if, if you try and contact people, a certain percent of people will respond because they, they, they see something in you that they saw in themselves and someone helped them. No one is an island. That is some kind of novelist um, delusion. The independent, I'll make it happen. I don't need anybody. Everybody needs somebody. Everybody needs some help. That's the way it really is. That's why people have partners. You know, that, that, that's why they reach out uh, you know, to people who are older because they know more. Not that they're smarter. They, they just happen through the accident of, of, of their life to, to know more because they're older. So don't be, don't be down on this one. Uh, thank you so much for the response. Uh, I'll give the floor to Liz now. Hi again. So in your book, you advise people to pursue worthy fantasies in life. How do you define a worthy fantasy and how should young people outline their goals, especially given the long, long work weeks that young people normally endure on Wall Street? Well, one of the realities um, in life is, is you can't do that many things well. Uh, and if you choose to do something that's entrepreneurial uh, or, you know, I, I put in that definition, you know, career. Uh, you can't be doing two careers at once and, and be really amazing at both. Maybe somebody can, but not the rest of us normal people. So, so it's important to recognize that if you're doing one thing, you can't do another one at the same time. So you better pick something that's really great. And, and you know, uh, assuming you can execute if you pick one thing that's ambitious, uh, that's, that's a breakthrough thing, something that will really appeal to a very large number of companies, you're, you're gonna work at 100% anyhow, no matter what you're doing. If you apply yourself to that grander vision, that grander opportunity, when you get there, you get a much better outcome. It's also easier to recruit people, ironically, for something that's big and bold and new if it's sound. If it's stupid, you can't recruit people. Occasionally, people are scared to do something that's, that's a little different than what everybody else is doing. But ironically, once it starts, you start making some headway, people are drawn to that vision. Uh, and that makes your life easier as well. So I, I think a lot of the game is, is won before the game starts. What sport are you playing? What city are you playing it in? Uh, and if you get those things right, or you invent something like Formula One, 
right? That's, that's a lot better than just being a driver in the Indianapolis 500. Uh, so so, so the, 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 the breadth of your vision, and I call them worthy fantasies. What's the most wonderful thing that could happen to you? And if you think about that and you settle on something, that's what you go after because it's got almost every benefit. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. And the next question is going to come from Steve Padovana. Um, One thing that you talked about in your book, uh, which resonated with me, um, is, is how important it is to never stop learning. Um, you know, considering we've got 500 undergraduate students on the, on the call today, what are, the speci- are there any specific skills that you think new graduates should be focused on to be successful now, um, but also more importantly, to be successful in the future and as technology comes in and things change. So, you know, curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think the first thing is to recognize that when you graduate, um, that's a start to life. That's not a finish. In in the old days, you know, that was sort of a finish, Uh, but it isn't anymore because knowledge is produced at an extremely rapid rate. Uh, and if you're not receptive to that, uh, then you'll become obsolete as a person that's not so old and you won't be effective and you won't see uh, new trends. Uh, and, and society is moving at such a rapid speed now. You, you have to uh, uh, understand and sense uh, where, where to be going. It's, it, it's like a, you know, a basketball player, you give them the ball, some people know you know, sort of how it's, the pattern's going to develop where there's going to be an open shot. And, and some people, you know, sort of have a gift of never getting that open shot. Uh, and the open shot in your lives will be knowledge. Uh, and um, everything you see is a learning experience. Uh, everything needs to be inputted and evaluated. Are you experiencing something that's unfamiliar? If you are, why? What is it? What's happening there? What is it telling you? Uh, and I think um, uh, that, that being in settings that encourage that continual innovation and taking in of new information um, is, is, is like a critical thing to be doing. Uh, I mean, you have to be mentally alert. If you're at Villanova Business School, you're already mentally alert. Okay, you're not going into the Dumbo, I'm not curious pile. Okay, the admissions people took care of that. Those other people aren't there. Uh, So, you know. Keeping that openness uh, alive is is absolutely critical because, you know, it's 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 like a, you know, in a way it's like a, a quarterback that drops back for a pass and you doesn't see anybody open. You wait for a tiny bit, and all of a sudden there's somebody open that you can hit. Uh, things change, and it's knowledge uh, and observation uh, of what's really happening uh, that allows you to see where to throw that ball. Uh, and you know it's not that hard to do, but you don't want to you don't want to throw the ball before you don't have to. You want that open. Uh, uh, shot, uh, you know, to take. So, so I don't know whether that's responsive to your uh, question. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, Rohan? Yeah, thanks, uh, Steve and Steve. One, uh, one thing that I, I liked a lot from your book is when you found it's pretty interesting is that you, when you're discussing the acquisition of Hilton, uh, you mentioned that there would be a big problem if the whole world just immediately stopped traveling. So today in a time where people have stopped traveling, how has that exactly impacted Blackstone and, and what kind of impact has COVID fundamentally had on where you think um, your business will, how it will operate in the future? Well, we, we used to be, uh, I guess, three years ago, uh, the largest uh, hotel, uh, owner of hotels and hotel rooms in the world. Today, we have very, very few. Did that turn out to be a good decision? You bet, right? 
because now um, nobody's staying at hotels. Nobody's really traveling. Uh, they're doing day trips. Car sales are almost at records. Used cars, prices are up higher than they ever were, uh, you know, as a percentage in a year because people want to go places. They don't want public transportation and, and then they want to get home. Uh, now, you say, how does that affect us? Um, uh, hotels are cyclical. You just happen to mention hotels. So, so I'll do a little hotel riff for you. Um, that, that these are cyclical assets. They're like office buildings with 10 year leases, except they're one night leases. So, so they have enormous volatility. Uh, and uh, when you have one of these huge dislocations, uh, and people don't travel, if you're not financed correctly, uh, you'll end up going broke. Uh, and depending upon how long that dislocation uh, is occurring. Uh, and, and so for people like ourselves, fortunately for us, uh, we're out of the vast amount of that exposure uh, and we will go back in uh, at a certain point uh, and, and, and build again. Uh, a very substantial position, but you have to have the timing uh, be right. So, so COVID is creating um, a dislocation, both positively, you know, for the people delivering food and, and Amazon and, and you know, sort of Microsoft Teams and, and you know, all, all kinds of, you know, positive things. But it's it's also creating enormous dislocation on the downside, and and investing in that, uh, the prices are a little higher because people thought things were going to get better faster. Uh, I think they'll find that it'll be, uh, you know, sort of it, it it it'll take till at least sometime in 22 where the world starts feeling right, because you have to get enough vaccine. And, and, and other antivirals so that the world can, can really get back to where, where it was without people being scared. Um, so, so, you know, that'll provide a lot of opportunity. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. So our next question is about your philanthropy. So how has your commitment to philanthropy impacted your investment decisions and the, the way that Blackstone as a whole invests? Well, that, that's an interesting question uh, because I've I've given away a lot of money so far, and you know I I'm lucky I still have a bunch left, and and you really can't take it with you. Uh, so and if you try and take it with you, uh, somebody else will give it away. So so there's only so much your family uh, and and friends uh, uh, need. So I I. I I actually, despite you know, the scale of what I've done, I, I don't look at myself as a philanthropist at all. Uh, it's, it's not what motivates me, basically taking my hard-earned money and making it go away. Uh, that, 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 that isn't the motive. Uh, my motive is to create wonderful things that help people and, and solve problems. Just like at the firm, every time we start a new business area, it's really exciting. And what we're doing is we're creating something. We're marshalling people. Uh, we're taking advantage of an opportunity. Um, uh, we're, we're raising money. Uh, we're, we're creating uh, something that didn't exist. And in every one of my major charity things, um, I'm addressing a problem that I think is really uh, uh, important where I have some unique key to, to, to helping. Uh, so, so when I, I started this program in China, um, uh, which we called the Schwarzman Scholars Like the Roads, uh, where we attract uh, you know, people to go to China and you know, built a college there. Um, you know, that looks like a Chinese courtyard house, and it was voted the best Asian education building or something uh, the year it was built. Uh, and, and, you know, I was trying to address the issue of a rising China 
uh, and a slower growing in the United States and the kind of friction that would develop. And I wanted to start something that would be a bridge uh, between the different cultures. Um, I wasn't trying to give money away. Somebody was trying to get some money from me, but you know, everybody always tries to get some money from me. That, that's not like a, a new thing. Um, that how important was that task that I thought up? I thought it was critical. I just had this very strong sixth sense that, that between China and the United States and the other Western countries, there was going to be a lot of friction. And, and, and part of it may be justified, but part of it was from just simple misunderstandings both ways. The, the Chinese didn't understand that what they were doing was really interpreted in the West. The West didn't truly understand some of the things that China was doing or trying to do. Uh, and I, I happened to be involved with both countries. I saw this and I said, I've got to do this. And so it was a huge lift. Um, but today, um, at, at, at 7.30 this morning, uh, I, I was on a, a Zoom uh, for the World Economic Forum, and I, I was the person who asked the first question uh, to the Premier of China, uh, uh, Premier Li. Uh, and he said, hi, Mr. Schwarzman. You know, we really love, you know, what you've done with the Schwarzman scholars. Leave aside my Blackstone stuff. And, you know, this is so important for our country to connect with other countries and have mutual understanding and so forth. Well, that cost me a bunch of money. But at the end of the day, who was going to pay for it? It was the same thing at MIT. I got interested in uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and um, uh, as a result of being in China, talking to Jack Ma, who started Alibaba, I didn't know anything about artificial intelligence. I'm a social science major. Um, I'm just like a generic guy, uh, and I'm sitting down with one of the experts in the world, and he's telling me about this stuff and how this could be dangerous for society and people have different views. And one of my donor, uh, my donors, one of the feeders to the Schwarzman Scholar Program is MIT. We always take some students, and I knew the president of MIT just by accident when seeing him, and we started talking about you know U.S. Uh, competitiveness in artificial intelligence. And he said, look, you know, we invented artificial intelligence at MIT. But, you know, we're like losing the applications now to China. We've got to really get better. So I, I, you know, I just said, well, what do you think? What would you like to do to get better? So he says, how about doubling my faculty in computer science? I said, well, that sounds like fun. I said, what else? He said, well, I'd like to take that increased faculty and have faculty all over every discipline. In MIT, you should have AI professors working with them. So we'll be the first AI-enabled university in the world. We will create knowledge faster. I said, boy, that, that sounds good. And, and uh, he, said, uh, he said, we'll also end up waking up our competitors, you know, at Stanford or Berkeley or, you know, sort of Carnegie Mellon. I said, why do you want to make them, wake them up? Why don't you just keep everything? He said, you wake them up because you're an academic. You're supposed to be producing knowledge uh, for everyone. Uh, so I, he said, that'll make the country even more competitive. So I said, okay. This is a great vision. What does it cost? He said, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? He said, I'm just talking to you. You know, we're just talking. This is my fantasy. I said, well, go and price your fantasy. So he came back at a billion one. So he said, why don't you give me a billion one? And I said, why don't you go jump in a lake? I said, I'm not giving you a billion one. Why would I ever do that? He said, because I need it to do this vision. And so, you know, we had a negotiation and the lowest I could get away with was 350 million, you know, to sort of make the thing, you know, sort of feel like it was going to be able to be raised. 
So then I said, look, if I give you 350, you're the scientist. I'm like a nobody. I don't really know what I'm doing. Why don't you give me 350 million for this? And I said, if you won't put up 350 to my 350, because you're the smart guys, then that means you don't care about this as the most important issue facing your university and the world today. So three weeks later, he came back with $350 million. So then we have 700 and we're raising the rest. Okay, did I sit around trying to figure out how to give my money away? No, I tried to figure out how to create something astonishing and wonderful. It's gonna be the, the Schwarzman School of Computing at MIT. It's gonna centralize all their stuff on artificial intelligence. It's it's creating, you know, this new environment in, in the research world uh, on AI. And, and so I'm an accidental philanthropist. I dream of these wonderful things to do. And then people look around and say, Who, who's going to put the money up? How about you? And then I get stuck with my own creations. So, so I don't have a conventional view of what a philanthropist is. And, and once we start these things, it's not about money. I get involved building these things. And I know I'm going on too long on this, but it's a, as you can tell, it's a huge passion of mine, just the same way, uh, you know, that, um, you know, that I started Blackstone. I was involved starting a company called Blackrock, which is the largest money manager in the world. I, I do these things. But I, I love to have them perfect. I love to have them realize their vision. They just accidentally require large amounts of money. Uh, so so that, that's how I approach philanthropy in every area. What can be done for the benefit of a situation that will impact the world or impact individuals where I can create something that others can join or not uh, to, to really help impact super important things. Awesome, thank you so much. That's such a unique answer. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Steve, was there a pivotal moment you recall in your life or career that brought you closer to your goals? That what? Was there a pivotal moment that you recall um, in your life or career that brought you closer to achieving your goals? No, um, I have I have all kinds of goals. So there's always something that's that's you know sort of a moment where I create that goal. There's always some breakthrough uh, in an area. Um, but for myself, I I don't think about it like that. You know, you, you'll find when you get older, um, it's the process of being. It's, it's the journey rather than some individual accomplishment. Um, and, and you have to like what you do. I think Michael Jordan would play basketball, you know, just to get on a court. You pay him a fortune, best guy he's ever played. He just likes putting a ball uh, in, in the hoop and going by people trying to stop him. Um, you know, I, I've had... I did one, one, one or two things that are, you know, I have a lot of things that are pretty neat in my life now. Um, but but I've, I've been involved in two of the trade deals uh, that the current administration has done, one with China uh, and the other one called the USMCA. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm what you call a non-combatant. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a government official, but, but I know all the people involved in these uh, deals and when they bog down, you know, people have asked me to get involved and solve them. And um, I think um, both, each of those, because this is outside of my normal, what I do in life, um, when, when they got done, um, 
And, um, you know, I was sitting in the front row of the White House um, at a ceremony where the Chinese were signing the deal. And, uh, you know, the president was saying, you know, Steve, you should really be up here with the three or four people. That was pretty neat because uh, it took a lot of work. I mean, I went to China eight times one year uh, for that. And the same with um, uh, USMCA, uh, where people sort of said the same thing. So, you know, it's ironic. It was, you know, uh, you know we graduated. Um, my wife and I are the largest donors, apparently, to Catholic schools um, uh, in the United States. And when the kids graduate, you know, and we have, uh, you know, it's just like a, they get together and, and, and with all those people. And, you know, we've helped change their lives. They'll have better lives than they would have if they hadn't gone to Catholic school that, you know, that's another moment like that. But there'll be another group the next year uh, and more challenges. So I, I, I don't look at anything as complete um, or anything that's legacy. I always look at what's new, what needs to be done, what's interesting to do. Um. I'm going to close with just a question. So be respectful of your time. We know you have a call to, to jump on. Um, just a question from one of the students in the audience. Uh, this is from Mike Steger. So for new entrepreneurs, what would be your advice on starting a new business and determining whether to take the risk? Um, and also what steps should one do to evaluate whether it's a good idea or not? Yeah, the first thing I'd say is don't take a risk. Um, uh, Almost every entrepreneur <laughs> I know who's been really successful thinks he's going to be successful. He doesn't think or she doesn't think they're actually taking a risk. They think they're going to be quite successful doing whatever this is. And if you really think you're at risk, you probably are. And avoiding risk is much more healthy for your bank account and for your emotional life. So what I'd say it is the first thing is, is, is that if, if you don't have that sense that this is a wonderful thing and that you have the appropriate resources to prosecute it and you won't be able to really attract people to either be customers or, or journalists to write about it or help you, um, if you don't have that sense that you've got that, um, it's like you, you have to have the sense that it's like an open 10-foot jump shot. The, the chance that a decent player will, will get that in the basket is probably 7 out of 10. It, it, you, you don't want to be taking, you know, 35-foot, you know, jump shots with two people hanging on you. You're probably not Steph Curry. There's only one of them. Okay, only one of them. You want the 10 foot open shot and, and you wanna be passing the ball around enough to get that shot. You don't wanna take a really hard shot and, and, and you do the definition of what's a hard shot, not other people. And when you see it, you know, somebody like Jack Ma, you know, I visited the United States, I guess in the early 1990s, the internet was just sort of a gleam in the eye. He started an internet company. He knew it would be successful. He couldn't even register it in China. They had no name for that. So he spent a year trying to register it. Then he tried to sell something and basically went broke. Uh, and then he came back again because he knew the internet was great. And the same thing happened. The second thing failed. Uh, but he knew this was going to work. And the third time, it's become one of the biggest companies in the world. And, and Jack, I guess, is one of the 10 richest people in the world now because he knew that was going to happen. Uh, so so I, I, I don't know, Steve, it, 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 I don't know if that's, if that's uh, that 
responsive uh, to, to, to what you, you were asking, but you, you have to have that feeling and you have to know that you've got the resources to, to, to raise the money necessarily necessary to, to, to help pull that forward, that you, you have the personal commitment to, to sell continually. You're, you're selling every person to join you on this adventure. Uh, they don't just show up. You've got to encourage them. You've got to be like a missionary uh, for what you want to do. And you've got to have the personality to say, okay, this is this requires 110% effort. Uh, and I'm ready to do it. And if it requires 120%, I'm in for that too. This is not a work-life balance thing that somebody writes about. There is no work-life balance uh, on this stuff uh, any more than being an amazing athlete. They, they're training all the time. They just don't show up on game day, right? It doesn't work like that. So, so, so you need that kind of commitment and feeling. That you, you, you need that worthy fantasy, you, you know, to, that justifies your time. Um, and, and, and it's nice if you have a network uh, of people you know, so, so you're not isolated. You, you can have some other people try and help. You can reach out to them for advice. But that's how I do it. Finally, before we sign off, you should buy my book. Uh, I don't get any money from it. I mean, I give away all the money. Uh, it's called What It Takes. I, I saw someone had a copy of it someplace. If I were a better salesman, I'd have one and I'd there we go. hold it up. Okay, so there we are. Uh, it doesn't even cost that much. Um, and it only takes seven hours to read. And it's very, <laughs> and it's very funny, uh, they tell me, uh, you know, because I get myself into a lot of trouble with, with some frequency. Uh, so so uh, if you buy it, you can do it on Amazon. You can just hang up. And, and just, you know, input Amazon and they'll sell it to you for next to nothing. I think these things are down to like 15 bucks. If you can't afford 15 bucks, I mean, you know, somebody will lend it to you. Uh, and there's a bunch of really good stuff to learn that's practical. It's not about me. I mean, I'm just sort of a, I float through the thing, but I didn't write a book to be about me. I'm not that terrific. Uh, I'm not worth a book, but what I've learned in 50 years, you know, of taking body blows uh, and figuring out how to adjust and learn from failures, because we all have them, that's worth your knowing. It's worth your reading. Uh, and that's why I wrote it, not, not for any financial thing. It's the biggest sinkhole financially I've ever been involved with. It took so much time. I mean, you'd have to, you know, give me $10,000 a book to make it interesting. Uh, you know, so it's not a money thing. It's, it's my desire uh, to help you, uh, to, to, to share lessons that you can take on board so that your life won't be as difficult as mine has been. That's the objective of the book. Well, Mr. Mr. Schwartzman, on behalf of all of us at Villanova University and Villanova School of Business, we'd like to thank you for agreeing to do this session, to take our questions, for sharing your insight. And I was gonna say, I hope all the participants read your book, especially make sure you read his 25 rules for work and life because it does give a lot of good practical advice. And I wanna turn it over to Provost Richie <clears throat> to close us out. Well, I wanted to thank you as well, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, just two quick comments. Number one is I love the term accidental philanthropist. And we have so many good things going on at Villanova. If you wanna have have, ever have an accident here, we're very interested in that. <laughs> Um, but all kidding aside, I love the way you talked about your philanthropy because I, when I speak to folks that have, are generous to Villanova, it is truly an investment and it is a different kind of return. It's not a financial return, but it, I, you can hear it in your voice. There's an emotional return and I think that, that there is something to that. And then the last thing, even more on a more serious note, I would like to formally invite you and anyone else from your high school track team to come to uh, be my guest at Villanova and uh, we'll give you the, uh, the VIP treatment and check out our facilities and meet with uh, Marcus O'Sullivan, who uh, is our track coach and has more sub four minute miles indoors, I think, than any man in history. So uh, 
you have an open invitation to join us here at Villanova. Well, I, I appreciate that. When, when, when I was going to the Penn Relays as a high school kid, Villanova had both Frank Budd, who was the fastest 100 runner in the world, uh, and Paul Drayton, who won the silver medal uh, in, in the Olympics on the same uh, 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 relay team. Uh, and when you saw this, the 800 uh, meter relay uh, at the Penn Relays, with two of the fastest runners in the world on one college team, it was breathtaking. It was magic. It was astonishing. And, uh, you know, that's part of the Villanova brand. Well, we'd love to have you back uh, here to see our facility. So anyway, on behalf of the president of the university and Dean Russell, just thank you so much for sharing your time, your and, and wisdom with us. This was su such a great session. Thank you to all of the students who set it up as well. Thanks. Thanks. Have a nice Thanks, evening. Steve.